Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Hardy uh, with AASHTO. I'm the Program Director for Planning and Performance Management, and I want to welcome everybody to webinar number 34 um, of our Transportation Asset Management webinar sphere, uh, series that's been sponsored by a uh, FHWA and AASHTO, I think, for the past four or five years. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on the PM2 bridge and pavement targets um, and how they relate to the asset management plans. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very critical, important uh, a topic, um, very timely, uh, given where all the states are uh, when it comes to performance management provisions and, and developing initial asset management plans and having to develop full, you know, final asset management plans um, uh, next year. Um, we have pre uh, presented webinars in this sort of uh, bi-monthly or every other month uh, webinar series since uh, 2012. In our last webinar, we covered some of the great, what we call the greatest hits from the 12th National Conference on Transportation Asset Management that was held in July in San Diego. It was a great session. Uh, if you were not able to attend, I would encourage you to look it up on the Ashto TAM portal. And on the on, on the the slide there on the right hand side, of the picture is a, a screenshot of the Ashto uh, TAM portal. You can get to it by visiting either TAM T A M dash portal dot com and click on TAM events in the main menu. Or if you go to TAM T A M dot transportation dot org, you can also get to the Ashto TAM portal. And that is part of a uh, a bigger portal on uh, performance management, transportation management us. If you want to access performance management information, we also have a transportation performance management portal, uh, tpm um, dash portal dot com. Um, there at the uh, TAM portal, you will uh, be able to register for all the other upcoming webinars in the series. The plan is to keep these going. They've been useful so far. Uh, people, we, we've gotten positive comments, positive feedback about them, so the plan um, is to keep them going. Um, so you can register for upcoming ones, and you can also find archives of previous webinars. So all 34 of the ones that, that we have done um, since 2012 are there. Um, and you can look at the slide decks, you can look at the recordings, all that good stuff. So links to videos, links to slides uh, from today's web web webinar will be posted to the site either later on today um, or you know first thing tomorrow or sometime later on this week. So they will be up there soon. Um, I know oftentimes people like to have the uh, slides and everything sort of you know, hard copy or on their computer. So we do make those available in a uh, PDF format. Um, if you have any, su any suggestions for future webinar topics or have questions for the, uh, during today's uh, webinar, please submit your comments uh, or questions using the, the, uh, the, the GoToWebinar Q&A feature. It's in the little um, pod that, that, that comes up that uh, allows you to um, navigate and to chat with people. So use that Q&A for the functionality. We do not plan to unmute phones because that would cause um, probably a lot of feedback and, and, and other audio um, issues. Um, so we will try to answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A session, uh, we, we, and we, we definitely look forward to your questions. So as they come up, please submit them. I know that Michael Johnson uh, from California cannot uh, stay till the very end, so we are going to be taking the Q&A uh, immediately. If you have the questions about his presentation or what they did in California, um, we'll be taking those questions immediately after um, he finishes uh, with Martin and, and uh, Meredith. We're going to take those at the end. Um, so with that, again, thanks for attending. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Gay from the Federal Highway Administration for a brief welcome on behalf of our co-sponsor, FHWA. So Steve, take it away. Thank you. Thanks a lot there, Matt. FHWA, in cooperation with ASHTO, is very pleased to sponsor this valuable webinar series. Hard to believe this is already our 34th, and we're looking forward to many more. This series is, first and foremost, an opportunity to share practical, useful, timely information with the asset management community. So we're taking a look at PM2 targets and asset management plans. This is an area with a lot of activity and interest. We've already seen the first round of initial TAMPs. Some states included the target, many didn't. We're in the process of getting all the TAMPs certified. The first round of PM2 target setting and performance reporting. It's been exciting as the baseline reporting begins to establish our biannual performance reporting cycle. I think of the PM2 targets and asset management 
I quickly get excited to think about things like the performance gap analysis, the life cycle planning, the investment strategies, the financial plan, how this all comes together. And yes, it really breaks down the silos that we've some thought existed between TPM and asset management, and it all comes together. It all comes together very quickly. It's not shown on the timeline here, but going forward, we'll be looking at both mid-performance period performing uh, reporting and full performance period reporting on two and four year cycles. These will, of course, need to be coordinated with the TAMPS 10 year or longer time frame. These are new processes for all of us, and the speakers say are pioneers. They have broken new ground for the agencies, and today they will share their perspectives and some of the lessons they learned along the way. The whole idea of the TPM and asset management, you know, Susanna Hughes Rec is on the line. He said, if any questions come up, you know, she and I will be collaborating here. I just want to remind everybody about the November 1 date for state DOTs to request of their respective Federal Highway Division in the extension. And please do that because of penalties involved. We're going back to today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and I hope you'll learn a lot. I'm looking forward to it. And with that, let me turn it over to Yana Park of Spy Pond Partners. Yana. Thanks, Steve. Now, as Steve mentioned previously, the, pur the, the purpose of the webinar series is to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge with the asset management community. It is amazing to see the progress that has been made, and I think the participation in these webinar series have helped advance practice. For this webinar, the primary learning objectives are building working knowledge of key concepts and definitions relevant to transportation asset management, beginning to apply this knowledge in the context of PM2 targets and TAMP in order to answer the following questions. What approaches are agencies taking to coordinate PM2 targets with the TAM? What benefits can my agency expect by better integrating PM2 target setting with the TAM? What are the key lessons learned for agencies as they move forward with development of their complete TAM? And of course, to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge. For the agenda today, Mike Johnson of California DOT or Caltrans will deliver our first presentation. And as Matt mentioned earlier, Mike has to go to another meeting. So what we would like is if, as you're listening to his presentation, please submit your questions and we will um, have those answered at the end of Mike's presentation. For the, the for Meredith and Martin, presentations, we'll do those at the end. So our second presentation, we'll hear from Meredith Hill of Maryland um, State Highway Administration. And our final presentation will be from Martin Kidner of Wyoming DOT. Just another reminder, please submit all your comments or questions using the webinar's Q&A feature of the webinar menu bar at any time during today's presentation. And as Matt had mentioned earlier, the slides and video for today's webinar will be um, available in the TAM portal. Now, let's get started with our first speaker. Mike Johnson is the State Asset Management Engineer at Caltrans. In this role, Mike led the development of, Cal of the California TAM. He's going to speak to us today about Caltrans' target setting approach. And I just want to say, echoing Steve's comment that our presenters today are pioneers, and Mike has uh, been a pioneer in asset management throughout his career. So now I will turn it over to Mike. Mike, are you on mute? Um, good afternoon. This is Mike Johnson. Uh, thank you, Hiana and Steve and Matt, for the introduction. 
Um, I'm going to run through quickly um, the approach that Caltrans used in our target setting. And I, I'll say before we really get into the details that we use the same approach for our TAMP and our PM2 uh, targets. So um, there was discussion about, well, how do these things relate to each other? Our, our approach was identical for both. Um, but before I get into the details of how we went about doing it, um, let me give you a little bit of uh, landscape for Caltrans. So we, um, we have 18 metropolitan planning organizations in California, and we have 26 regional transportation planning agencies. And you can kind of see the map here. Um, in some cases, we have regional transportation agencies that are embedded in the jurisdictions of MPOs. And then in this map, in the, the kind of light orange color, you see parts of the state that, that aren't covered by an MPO at all. Um, for the most part, these are, are pretty rural uh, in nature, but there is that component of sort of non-represented locals out there. Um, so that's, I guess, what was on our plate in terms of how do we, you know, when we, get, when we approach this target setting methodology, how do we engage these folks um, and engage them early and, and bring them on board in the TAMP development process um, and, and we did that, and so that made the PM2 target setting much, much simpler. Um, but let me, let me give you a little bit more of the landscape, um, because I don't know how common this is around the country. So if we look at the entire state of California in this green, we had about um, 180,000 road miles or 402,000 lane miles of pavement. Of those lane miles, the locals had about 352, 353,000 of them, and Caltrans was responsible for about 50,000. Of those, you kind of break that down into non-NHS and NHS. So in, in, Cal, in Caltrans, our responsibility is about 37,000 NHS lane miles. And the locals have about 19,000 NHS lane miles. So if you look at the bottom on the far right, you see that the local non-NHS is a huge amount of pavement. And it's important, you know, and I think we, we kind of faced this really early on with when we started meeting with our, our locals um, and our, our MPOs and our TPAs, that when we're, what we're talking about in asset management is 6% of the local pavement in California. And on the state side, it's 74% of all pavement. Okay, so one of the challenges that we had to overcome was, you know, the locals look at this and say, well, you're only, you're only hitting a little bit. And, the, and really the way we did that is by just reinforcing that this 6% or this 74% in, in theory are the most critical routes um, that, that we have by functional classification. So in bridges, we had a similar um, breakdown that we did and, and we showed these at the workshops so that everybody was kind of on the same page. About the same number of bridges, uh, and this data is a little bit old, but it's about 12,500 for the state uh, highway system and about 12,500 for the local system. Um, when we look at the NHS, about 9,200 are the state, and there's only six, there's 1,600 of the local bridges are actually NHS. Um, when you break this down, Caltrans has responsibility for 90% of the deck area. Uh, compared to 10% on the local side. The NHS for, Cal, for Caltrans represents 83% of all of the deck area that Caltrans manages. So there's 17% that's outside of that. And down in the bottom, there's some notes here. And this, I want to just call attention to this note number two, that um, there are over 250 local agencies, owners of NHS bridges. 
Um, and we look at this and it's a huge number of cities and counties. 87% um, of them own less than 10 bridges on the NHS. So this, you know, it doesn't really necessarily rise up to, to something that they're super concerned about because it's a tiny fraction of their inventory. Um, so we had to overcome that and we had to explain to them the importance of this target setting and how this um, spills its way through PM2 and ultimately into their regional transportation plans. So we had a basic simple three-step target setting approach. Identify the inventory and current condition of NHS pavements and bridges regardless of owner. Caltrans did this. We funded the collection of pavement data and Caltrans has historically done almost all the local bridge inspections in California anyway. So we had that information in the NBI. Then when we were doing the TAMP, we, we went to, we had workshops, we brought all the MPOs together and we said, look, where do you think you're gonna be in 10 years? Um, and we, we gave them the opportunity to tell us based on their own funding, um, and, and other you know, conditions and, and expected projects where they thought they would be. And we took that information and we used that in developing our TAMP state targets, 10-year uh, targets. We, we did the same approach when it came to PM2. We went to them, and even though the law doesn't um, give them the ability to set a two-year target, we asked them, where are you going to be in two years? Where do you think you're going to be in four years? And, you know, when you think about asking them, um, it's, you know, this is done, you know, we had a series, we, we had workshops initially, then we had some uh, webinars. Ultimately, we developed some forms to use that, that would solicit this information. Um, it's really complicated um, because in California, a lot of these MPOs um, have within, within their jurisdiction um, counties that have their own sales tax for transportation. A number of them have passed bond measures for transportation. Um, others had recently passed ballot initiatives. And then if that wasn't enough, um, California passed a, a significant gas tax increase um, for all, all gasoline sold and, and some fees associated with vehicle registration that in effect put about $5.2 billion a year into transportation, both state and local. And so at the time we're asking them for these targets, they're, they're trying to um, develop plans for where they're putting this money and get these projects lined up. So the timing was not ideal, but we asked them, where are you gonna be in two years, four years, given your, your budget, your conditions for your agencies? And then we used a quantity weighted approach to develop statewide targets. So if, if Caltrans has 90% of the influence of bridges, then our target will carry 90% of the total weight for the state of California and other agencies would carry weight commensurate with the amount of inventory that they own. So pretty simple to say, um, but this required us going to every MPO and asking them for this. There were, you know, lots of questions. Um, you know, again, we had fairly frequent communication with them. Uh, we developed Q and A's for them. We did lots of things. We gave them data. We gave them all their bridge data. We gave them all their pavement data um, so that they could look at things and, and sort of verify what we had. When we got all these responses back, um, we put them into a worksheet, and this is this worksheet is really kind of the guts of how we did our our California numbers um, for two and four year. So we look, and there's a lot of numbers here. Um, this is I'm showing bridges. So if you look, I'm going to focus your attention to the far right column here. And you see the percent impact to the statewide deck area. So the state has 90% of the deck area. All of the local uh, MPOs have 
but it's not the same. In other words, some of these are so small, they, you know, it's, it's finer than a tenth of a percent. Um, but then there were certain agencies that might have 6% influence on the state, 2% influence. And so we, we made sure that those that had a big impact on the state's number, we coordinated extra close with them because they had the potential to swing the statewide number. Um, so our targets that we developed in Caltrans were, were to have three and a half percent poor um, area in two years. We are currently at 3.7. So we were anticipating getting a little bit better. Um, and then we asked the locals for the same um, the same percentages. And you can see their percentage in pores all over the map, um, which is really an indication that this isn't a one size fits all. You know, you, you can't set one number and expect everybody to adhere to that number. So we allowed them to tell us what they could do. And then we used those numbers to come up with our statewide number, which is 4.6%. That 4.6% is reflective of a 90% influence from the state at 3.5% and a 10% influence from all of these other agencies down below. So it's purely just mathematically a quantity weighted average. But by doing this, when we put out a statewide number and the MPOs have the choice to either adopt the statewide number or to create their own, um, their option to create their own has already been embedded in this to come up with the statewide number. So there's not a lot of motivation for them uh, unless, you know, they're changing their mind about what they initially told us. Um, because when we went out to them, we made it very clear that that was sort of a non-binding thing, that they still had the opportunity to set their own target. But so far, I have not seen any any MPO, um, at least that has notified us that they're not adopting the statewide target. So in a nutshell, um, the approach was to get their input really early on. In fact, we did it in the TAMP. They had seen it in the TAMP for the 10 year. So then moving to two and four year was um, just a shorter version of the same thing. And the targets that we're reporting to the federal government for PM2 reflect each agency's individual expectations. So we're not, while we have a number for the state, each of these MPOs, in fact, has a different target. Um, the approach is pretty transparent and it's inclusive. This was, in our workshop, was one of three different approaches that we laid out. And this was by far the one that um, that really resonated with everybody. So that's kind of the California story for our PM2 target setting and how we can be assured that they're in sync with our TAMP. Thanks, Mike. Um, there is a question. Um, the question is, how was the target developed for the state? Was it based on available funds or was it based on historical trends? And I want to add to that question because it's related. Um, you have a referendum coming up that's going that could potentially change your funding scenario for um, for your assets. And um, what are you doing, kind of um, related to that 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 possibility? But start with a question on how, um, whether it was based on available funding or historical trends? So it's a great question. Um, during the development of the, of the TAMP and some operational documents that we have for programming, we, we develop performance cost relationships in a database um, for these assets. And in effect, we, the, this software that we develop would allow us to pick any performance level and it would tell us how much it would cost to achieve that performance level. Um, we presented these to our transportation commission in California as a series of curves. And there was, there was obvious breakpoints in these curves where 
to get conditions better than a certain place, you started to have some significant diminishing returns. In other words, it was costing you a lot more to get that next, you know, fraction of a percent of improved condition. And so from these performance cost curves, we, we basically said, here are all your options. Uh, for, and the curves included fair and poor all on one chart. So they could, you know, if you want bridges at our, our target in the 10 years for bridges is one and a half percent of the area in poor condition. We're at 3.7. So there's a price tag associated with achieving that level of performance. And these curves allowed a very rapid discussion of the trade-off between dollars and performance. Um, so that's how we did it. If we had a dramatic change in funding, like we did when we were in the process of developing the TAMP, the, the gas tax increase kicked in and, and the funding that we had uh, doubled in a sense for uh, rehabilitation, maintenance of the existing system. We, we had to adjust our investment plan in, in effect in, um, in our tool and in our TAMP and if for some reason our budget were to be cut, we would have to reverse that process. Um, but certainly it's a lot easier to have additional capacity than it is to take capacity away. So we're, you know, we're, we're optimistic that the people of California will uh, realize the value of, of the investment in transportation and this referendum uh, to repeal it will fail. Thanks, Mike. So, so in response to the question, you did you you develop the targets based on available funds. We the the targets were we developed the targets or the curves based on all available funding scenarios. In, in other words, we would give a range for condition. You know, let's say a bridge is from you know forty percent fair down to five. And we would give a range of poor um, conditions from the current at three and a half down to one and a half. I think we went even to one. And we went in and had a discussion with our transportation commission and said, these are the options that we've got. And, you know, we had a recommendation based on what we thought was relatively reasonable with the budget that we have. So I would say, yes, they, they are, they were, um, set with our available funding in mind? Okay. That sounds good. All right. Thanks, Mike. This was a um, great presentation. Um, so let's move on to our next presentation. Um, we're going to hear from Meredith Hill. Um, she is the perfor uh, performance planner with the Maryland FHA Innovation Performance Planning Division. Uh, Meredith is a policy and practice professional delivering data-driven approaches to capital planning and programming. She uses system performance, economics, and land use indicators to analyze fiscal impacts to public jurisdictions and the economic impacts to regional economies of multimodal transportation solutions. Prior to joining MDOT, Meredith was an economic analyst with the State of Missouri Economic Research and Information Center and a land use economist focused on the cost of growth to public infrastructure. Okay, take it away, Meredith. Thank you very much. Uh, Hyanna's introduction is a long-winded way of saying that I am possibly the newest member to state asset management. Uh, I inherited the Maryland TAMP in January of this year, shortly after I joined back to State Highway from the Secretary's Office of MDOT. So I've been working with TPM and TAMP for just over 10 months. Um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what Mike Johnson and Caltrans Experience talked about in terms of our success and our process was um, relationships, relationships with Federal Highway, with MPOs, um, and all of the various different 
owners of NHS assets in um, Maryland. So, uh-oh, my, my slides don't progress. Hold on just a second. Let's see if we can get this working. There we go. Okay. Um, I want to set the framework of Maryland and MDOT very quickly. And then I'm going to touch on the NHS in Maryland and our targets and project projections. Uh, and then I want to end with our next steps because working through TPM target setting and development of the initial TAMP, we learned a lot and we're excited to apply that to larger MDOT asset management practices and performance management. And throughout, I'll kind of touch on some lessons that we've learned. So when it comes to um, Maryland, I'm going to focus on a lot of MDOT SHA's system because similar to Caltrans, the state-owned portion um, of the system is the critical portion of the system. Um, the NHS is a subset of that. It's owned by a variety. We have federally owned NHS assets, state, county, local owners. Um, but to give you a high level snapshot of the Maryland system, this, what you're seeing of the M.SHA SHA portion of the system is really telling. You know, SHA roadways, they account for 17% of the total highway miles, but they serve 66% of the total traffic, 70% uh, of the truck traffic. And of course, we, uh, as part of MDOT, we are also helping and supporting our uh, business units across MDOT, which includes the port, uh, the, the um, BWI airport, and then our transit uh, systems as well. So in 2017, across the system in Maryland, we hosted 60 billion vehicle miles of travel in 2017. Ours is a dynamic system. Um, it's multimodal, it's complex, and we work with our partners daily to manage uh, a lot of demands on our system. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the other way that you can talk about the system and M.SHA's management of the system is through system preservation. We, our bridge and pavement responsibilities across the whole SHA system uh, is part of a complex trade-off balance that we maintain every day. The system preservation commitments include these 30 programs that compete for allocations every year. Traditionally, roughly 50% of almost a 1 billion system preservation program is bridge and pavements wholly, the SHA portion of the system in Maryland. Um, of the total pavement and bridge program, it can vary between 50 to 60% of the pavement program investing in the NHS portion, and it could be uh, the bridge deck area on the NHS represents about 75% of SHA's bridge deck area. So it's an, um, an important investment of the portion of the bridge program that's invested on the NHS every year. Uh, but this really became and continues to be an important part of the education of our local partners and the constant communication that MDOT has with our local partners so that they're understanding these in incredible demands and the balancing act that we do every day for trade-offs and that we share with our partners as they're raising their competencies and managing their portion of the complex system. 
So if a picture is worth a thousand words, good data is absolutely priceless. Here you see our NHS pavement conditions from calendar year 2016. Um, this is data that is collected by MDOT SHA, my partners at the Office of Materials Technology, and we share this data and the corresponding bridge data with our local partners uh, so that they can be using, we can all be using the same data. And listed on the left are some of our partners, our NHS owners. Um, and then as part of development of TPM and TAMP, it is absolutely, we could not have done it without the Federal Highway Maryland Division Office and our MPOs. They facilitated workshops, they facilitated peer exchanges, and together we were able to just raise competencies, awareness, and collaboration with all of our NHS owners. So that was absolutely imperative. And in the development of the TAMP, the number one risk identified by our MDOT SHA Office of Structures for consideration in the TAMP was if planning data is not available by all of our partners or from all of our partners, the future needs may not be defined. This uh, we struggle with every day. We struggle with getting the best information from all of our partners so that we can be um, developing the best program statewide and individually to for uh, asset management. So diving deeper into the NHS story, uh, again, similar to uh, Caltrans, MDOT SHA submits for all non-federal structures. So we have really good data on a, all the non-federal structures on the NHS, but we did struggle in collecting good um, federal structure information. We still continue to build that. Uh, our material, Office of Materials Technology collects all of the inventory and condition information for the directional lane miles of the NHS regardless of ownership. So we had amazing historical records uh, for pavement on all four metrics. So our targets uh, used all, and our um, projections in the TAMP used all four um, criteria to set our targets. And both teams have mature management systems that were capable of making reasonable condition um, projections. We did analyze all three suggested scenarios in the initial TAMP, and for the most part, we focused on the um, projections of conditions based on reasonable available funding. But we decided on that because we, we both teams individually were able to do uh, complex scenarios of all of the, the um, investment strategies. So at a high level uh, for bridges, our baseline is um, from 2017, just shy of 30% good, with very little change in the short term and a 10-year projection of a slight decrease in the inventory of good. But um, from the short term to the long term projection, very little change in the poor condition. And that is partially due to when our governor, Hogan, um, took office in 2015, he challenged MDOT to address all 69 structurally deficient bridges that were identified at that time when he took office. MDOT met that challenge in this summer, July of 2018, by addressing all 69 of those structures. This exemplifies Maryland's commitment to delivering and maintaining a transportation system in the state of good repair. It's a, it's a message and a commitment that we had made and that we were delivering on. And it was evident in these baseline conditions and evident to our partners that we were delivering on that commitment and that we wouldn't waver from that commitment. <clears throat> 
And so our short-term and long-term projections for both bridge, and I'll talk about pavement in a moment, reflect that commitment. And it reflects the commitment of our partners as well. And they, we continue to work with them to, um, to be able to build into our management system and our scenario analyses the plans and programs that our local owner partners uh, share with us. In regards to pavement, same thing. We have a very strong baseline condition data from 2016, but it was then informed by historical years of data to look at through the pavement management system at reasonable two and four year targets and 10 year projections. I will pause here to say that one of the lessons that we learned when we were discussing two-year targets, or excuse me, um, targets and the TAMP was the difference between a target and a goal and a projection. Um, because of the commitment that we have always had to delivering a so strong system in Maryland, but also countered with the system preservation trade-offs and the, the fiscally responsible asset management strategies, we found it uh, better to be talking about that reasonably available funding strategy and the projections of the conditions with, from that strategy. So the 10-year performance projection is based off of ours and all of our local partners' capital programs, which are essentially, which are mostly six-year programs. And if we continue that trend of what's already planned and programmed, in 10 years' time, our performance projections um, look as they do. But we are going to revisit that 10-year goal line every four or five years. So we will continue to, to raise awareness of our partners and increase our data um, so that we're developing better scenarios and uh, better proje projections and targets accordingly. I'm going to end with sort of our next steps because obviously as we all know we were developing short-term targets and long-term projections running concurrently uh, and only now as uh, Steve alluded to in his timeline are we starting to really integrate those two. So I mentioned before I had inherited the TAMP in January of this year and we took it over the finish line uh, for the initial TAMP and that's certified, but we still have the final TAMP and I'm still working with our MPO partners for them to set their two and four year uh, infrastructure condition targets by November of this year. They, those conversations have been amazing. Uh, we have multi-state MPOs and so they, uh, especially in the Washington area, um, managing three different state processes. They did a wonderful job of facilitating conversations across state lines to develop um, informed targets. The other ones, uh, Baltimore, for instance, because Baltimore City owns a significant portion of NHS assets, uh, the Baltimore BRTB region MPO facilitated local conversations uh, to engage them and to under so that they could understand the transparency of our process. Those are still continuing. Uh, in the most, for the most part, people are supporting the state's targets, but especially across state lines, sometimes they're doing regional targets. Regardless of what decision they made the facilitation of those conversations were invaluable to MDOT and to us delivering a statewide uh, target and projection. So we're going to continue to host those. We're going to continue to facilitate some workshops uh, through our data collection um, process over the, the rest of this calendar year. 
We're also engaging our leaders uh, across all of our partners it, so that they're um, comfortable with what we have put forth in the initial TAMP and they're, for, they're helping us deliver that financial plan element of the final TAMP. We're still building our team. We're still increasing competencies across the board. And of course, we're also um, increasing our data, the, the quality of our data and our information, including, and this is what I'm really excited about in next month or maybe December, uh, the work of a team looking at climate change, a pilot program of six states that Maryland participated in. They've developed a methodology to determine roadway and bridge vulnerability, and our respective asset management teams are working to integrate that methodology into their management systems and into their analyses and our uh, risk and resiliency asset management conversation will benefit from that great work. And I'm excited to integrate that into the final TAMP uh, and to also bring those experts onto that our asset management team that we're building. And of course, you know, it's always the balancing of the trade-offs and the financial uh, capital program with the realities of a, the state of good repair and our commitments from our administration and to our customers uh, that we are reflecting and, and coming and understanding how to tell that story in our planning documents. The next step for MDOT is our secretary's office has challenged all of our business units, so that's everybody from the Motor Vehicles Administration, port, transit, airport, um, the MDTA, the Toll Authority, SHA, we are all, they've challenged each of us to make, make an asset management plan for the seven critical infrastructure classes uh, you see here. And those plans are, are to cover six goals that you see. Absolutely, first and foremost, know what we own. Know the conditions of those assets. Make a plan for the state of good repair. Commit to best practices and, and develop a framework. Well, because of our work with the asset management plan, because of our um, sister D, uh, business unit, the transit administration, they did an asset management plan, we are in a position to be um, mentors for our colleagues in our other business units and use the template and the lessons learned from our asset management plan from the NHS to do it across our entire system, but also to use the template for different types of asset classes, including even our IT systems, which you know, data is everything. And so understanding how to manage that asset the the systems the infrastructure and the data themselves is invaluable and so i'm excited with the daunting task of developing seven other asset management plans but i feel like i've gotten a head start because we participated in delivering this um, national highway system asset management plan Last, I will say the, the other part of us being able to raise the competencies of our colleagues and develop all of this in a transparent um, way, we have a fairly nimble and rudimentary website through which I can push updates and information and data to our partners, and it's part of our MDOT GIS open data portal, where MDOT as a whole is collecting, curating, and sharing data so that all, us and all of our partners can work with the same information and trust its accuracy. So the website is there and, and the larger data portal is there if you would like to look at ideas um, 
and any other information that you're looking to see from the Maryland uh, side of things, I, I encourage you to visit our, our resources or contact me directly. Thank you, Meredith. I love um, how you um, presented the, the target and the projection information. That was very clear. Um, <clears throat> all right, thank you. For our final presentation today, we'll hear from Martin Kidner. Martin is currently the state planning engineer for the Wyoming Department of Transportation. His 37-year career began after graduating from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. He worked in various field offices for 15 years overseeing construction projects, before moving to district maintenance engineer, then as a district engineer. After a deployment to the Middle East with the National Guard, Martin was appointed as the asset manager and then folded this duty into his current position as the state planning engineer. He's a licensed engineer in Wyoming and holds a master's degree in strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. And with that, I'll turn it over to Martin. Okay, just a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you. The, um, you know, the, just to drop a dime on Matt Hardy, the, when MAP21 came out outlining all of this stuff, he referred to it as the Planning Perpetual Employment Act. And so as a state planning engineer, you know, that it's definitely how do we keep um, all of these plans lined up as we're talking about today, you know, the performance management section along with the the asset management, uh, those are all important things to do. Um, I really want to uh, say thanks to Meredith for a lot of the things she was talking about were kind of the higher level things. I'm going to get a little bit more into detail about what some of these things are as we tried to shake out a two-year to a four-year uh, target setting out there along with the, the, the long-term um, performance outcomes that we're looking for. And so um, I titled this overview as communications because it's all about how we're telling our story about how we are doing, what are our trends, and what are our gaps in our performance that we have out there. Um, I will start with one of, uh, one of my many pet peeves for those that, have, that know me is that the uh, people that think that when I, when I make a decision or, or something like come out with an asset management plan that all of a sudden the needles on my dashboards will start changing. Um, I will then talk about uh, the funding issue and, and how, we, how we have to look at that along with our long-term, uh, long-lived assets and how they're being affected by inflation. I'll close the discussion by talking about how I want to show compliance be uh, tying performance planning and asset management together as we program these uh, projects and you know, that we got to show that we do have that, uh, that tie. So talking about the first one, you know, that I have an example up here about something that I lived through when the, uh, basically about the same time that Aura came out, when people started asking about how fast the needle uh, moves on your dashboard that you have out there. In this case here, the legislature started talking about a one-time funding boost for overlays, so our staff was able to begin building the contract documents immediately. And then, of course, our legislature met and passed the, the law in, um, in, in, the, in the winter. It became effective July 1st, and we immediately started advertising these contracts and put them out the next few months. With our construction season basically April through October, we had these projects um, completed the next summer, and then our measurement band that measured for our outcomes that we have, the quality of the pavement, uh, drove them the following summer, and they got loaded into the 2012 HPMS. So, you know, one of these things that I would almost call instant projects, something that we didn't even have on the shelf, but we got additional funds and we put them out, it was really three years away before we actually saw that needle move. Of course, there's some things that we could do to shorten it up, but the, the key idea is that these things are not, in, not instant. The second example that I'll just talk through a little bit is, well, what happens if we decide to build new targets, but we only have existing funds? Now, Wyoming did this um, through our TAMP process with the bridges, that when we looked at the bridges, we recognized that we were underfunding it for the long term. And so a policy decision had to be made to increase bridges by 30% 
within our within our existing investment plan. And so where do these bridges funding come from and, and when? Because the when part turned it important because the projects that were currently in our STIP, which is fully funded, are already designated. The public's been involved, the permit's been, uh, been secured and so on and so forth. So when we built the 2018 uh, asset management plan and added a, a change in how we were going to reflect onto the bridges, their performance, with those, we had to make a decision that we weren't able to increase that funding until 2020. So those jobs that were um, going to be lit in 2020 would be constructed at best that summer uh, because those are federal fiscal years. And But nevertheless, they would be reported to the Fed tape up there in 2021. So the moral of my story that I'm trying to get at here is that you know the two-year targets basically those are already things that are underway. You're not going to be able to really affect your two-year um, outcomes that we're going to look at. The, the, the best you can do is possibly start changing the outcomes in about three to four years, and um, realistically, even then, that it's going to be a pretty slow move. So the second thing I'll discuss a little bit is when we looked at the idea of, okay, what is our funding like? What you see here is YDOT's funding from the year 2000 to the year 2019. And you can see there that approximately from 2010, with the exceptions of some relatively small blip, our construction funding is flat. And so, well, if, if the last seven years are flat and it's projected to be flat, you know, that the funding is pretty predictable, and we couldn't come up with a, a good reason why we think the funding could increase. And so we, we chose to, when we built our model, to keep the funding flat. Now, before I get into this chart, I want to make one caveat, ex explain something real quickly here, is what you should see is that you, almost, you see a hump in, our, in the green line there. And that's the primary thing I'm going to be talking about, why that happened. But then the other thing that people will ask often is, well, why is this above the blue line, which is our target? Just real quickly, when we were running these green lines here, um, it was uh, based on cracking that was for the full width. You know, basically, you know, the, the new PM2 targets, those are based on cracking primarily just in the wheel rut. That change of how we measure cracking is actually going to reduce our, um, our numbers by a percent, but we don't have the models built yet on the 10th mile segments um, based on cracking only in the wheel ruts. And so we're going to end up with this, uh, we think it's going to be somewhere about an 8% decrease from our current standards to what the FHWA measurements are going to be. But I just wanted to add that caveat, uh, yeah, if somebody was wondering about why are our, our numbers of good and excellent pavements actually higher than what our target is. We expect to see that drop, and that's how we're um, we're uh, uh, we're compensating for that. So um, the, then, the second thing I wanted to point out, and I think that this is an important thing, is this: between 2016 and 21, the department decided that they were going to have to build some mobility projects, and it put a strain on our ability to do pavements and so forth. And so, what's happening is that we're seeing a decrease in our pavement uh, projections up till 2021, but then we're gonna start seeing an increase after, after that is what we're looking at. My concern is somebody's gonna step in here at about 2024 and say, wait a minute, you know, we're funding you and it's increasing uh, the, qual the quality of your pavements out there. So when we first started setting our targets out here at YDOT, that our, our executive staff up, uh, said um, basically they wanted to keep the condition the, the same. They, that was one of the first things that they came out and said, you know, how do we keep our condition flat? And, and so, well, what, is it, what does that mean um, to a modeler or to an asset management to say that you want to keep it flat? And if the funding is flat and you want to be able to look out there at a longer term target at 10 years or more, you know, what you may end up with is this hump that you see in that green line between 2021 and 2026. What happens on this is that we chose to, make, to lay out the situation where in 10 years, our condition of our pavements are going to be the same, uh, roughly the same as they are now. 
However, as inflation, and as you can see up there, we're calculating a 4% inflation rate. As that inflation was eating away at how much you could actually do it year after year, what it actually did was it made it so my pavement conditions improved for the first half of that long-term stretch, and then it starts to decrease because our funding is, is flat, we're saying that we're not going to shift any any additional funds over into the pavement and bridge. So therefore, we end up with this hump. And I wanted to stress that because that during those those times that you're either going to be increasing or decreasing off of that hump, you got to realize that that was where you know you you had to project out in order to to come up with that mythical thing of keeping our roads in the same condition as they are now. You know, the, I titled this one, Treatments Are Not System-Wide, and, you know, that's a common sense thing to us. Uh, you know, we, for example, Wyoming is treating about 10% of our interstate pavements per year with either a light, medium, or a heavy treatment. Um, how, you know, the change of it is actually relatively slow, even though, you know, what I'm showing here is, is the deterioration curve for a section of I-80, um, which has our steepest uh, de deterioration due to we're running 50% trucks on that, we're not treating all of the pavement. But even then, the deterioration rate that you see in green is only about 1% a year, and we're treating 10% of the roads. And so, well, what happens if you skip a year? Well, you know, I can sit there and tell my bosses that, well, maybe you can maybe you can rob from me for one year, but the bottom line with it is that, you know, the next year you've got to figure out how you're going to do 20% of the roads out there. So, you know, the key thing that I continue to beat the drum on is while, yes, it's actually feasible, that it's not going to ruin your, your curve that much to maybe maybe rob, rob from, uh, from pavement preservation for a year, but bottom line with it, you got to make up for it. You got to have a plan for it. You know, but next year you're going to have to have 20% of the roads being done and increasing year after year. So the next thing I had is when you start talking about things like bridges, um, this is our structurally deficient bridges long uh, long range look um, where I asked them to get um, further out. You know, the main like I say, the main drum I'm beating here is don't get real hung up with the two to four year targets. We are trying to get our bridges to last over 75 years, and as such, you know, the four-year targets don't even begin to show how the how the system is actually responding as a whole. As is shown here, you know, the four-year target for the red funding scenario was 6% structurally deficient versus the 2% structurally deficient on the green funding scenario, while the 10-year scenario shows a 9% versus a 2%. And the green funding uh, scenario, if I if I fund it for long term at that 10%, it will stay about in that condition where you can see I get a rapid rise um, by not funding the bridges um, to to that level. And that's the power of looking out. And you know, yes, the two and four years are important, but the, you've got to be looking out there long term in order to be able to understand how these very expensive and very long lived. Uh, assets are actually going to be happening, uh, responding to your decisions that you have. So, you know, my premise is, is that the two-year chance is, is not really so much a target per se, but it's a chance for you to say, are you on track for meeting the four-year target? You know, if, if the state is seeing a lot of um, emergency work they've got to do or something like that, the, the feds are giving us the ability to, um, to adjust our targets you know, but really the two years is actually already water under the bridge as far as I'm concerned. You know, the four-year targets, you know, while it's going to start showing what your decisions are that you've been making, how it's going to change that, that proverbial needle out there, that the realistic thing is, is that you need to look out there longer term um, and, and, you know, so that under your camp where you're actually looking out there and saying, okay, just as our best guess, how is this going to respond out there and about the 10 year. I understand why we talk about four-year targets. That's what our STIP is required to be. That's where we have the funding pretty well assured, and, and we got these projects somewhat locked in, so it makes sense to say this is what we think we're going to have in four years. But as the asset managers, you've got to be looking out there saying, okay, best guess with our investment plan, what's this going to respond to in the next 10 years? If you start to fall behind, especially when the systems are very long-lived, like bridges, 
you don't have a good pre uh, impression of what the, the trends are, are going to be. So how is Wyoming tracking this? It's, you know, the, um, the, the first thing I usually start with when I talk to other decision makers is, that, you know, just fundamentally, what's the difference between an output and an outcome measure? Um, and that's really where you start talking about the short and the long range um, plans when you look at the TAMP. But output measures do not address the change in the measure and an example is dollar spent. Output measures are generally easier to compile and are helpful indicators. On the other hand, an outcome measure is the level of performance or achievement that, is, that has occurred because of the activity or services that we provide as the DOT. In, in our case, this is a percent of pavement in good condition and so forth. But the closer approximation is the miles of, of, of light, medium, heavy pavement treatments per system or road and the resulting increase in conditions. For example, if we, um, if we do a rut filling that the rut should get better and that's closer, uh, that's a closer outcome measure than a dollar spent on pavement. So an outcome measure are the more appropriate measures that we want to try to seek as, as asset managers. So how Wyoming is actually doing this is that we're actually, every year, our, uh, this is uh, from our materials section, they, um, for example, what they have there is, this is District 1, and so on the District 1, their um, interstate, they need to do 11 miles of heavy treatment within their district on the interstate. And so we're tracking, you know, by district, how many, uh, how many miles that they've got to be accomplishing we then back that off by, a, by an average cost to come up with the dollars that we are going to provide them. But um, th this is a key thing on that is that we're tracking the light, medium, and heavy, which as you can see up there, we call 1S, 2S, 3S, um, pavement system per system type. And then we track the committed projects by system, the type of tr treatment and validating the locations with the, um, with the materials branch because that those guys are the ones that we're going to say, okay, the proposal for a heavy treatment on the interstate or these mileposts, do those, uh, does this location actually compile, uh, co comply with the ma uh, pavement management system, yes or no, before we enter it into the SPIP. So in summary, um, first, uh, you know, the thing that I, I continue want to want to say that the two-year targets probably re reflect only what is already happening and don't have high uh, hopes of actually influencing it. Second, the four-year target is good because of fiscal constraints, but must be nested into the long-term trends because really we're interested in trends. We're not looking for a point in time. Third, the system doesn't deteriorate instantly. Don't expect immediate changes. And then fourth and finally, the closer you can make your indicator to show how you're moving towards the target is better. Miles of changing from one condition to another is YDOT's way of doing that. And so with that, I'll turn it back over for questions. Thank you, Martin. That was a very clear presentation on how you tackle the, the target setting and projection process. Um, so that concludes our presentations for today. Thank you to all of our attendees. Now it's time for the Q&A. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature of the webinar toolbox, and I will just take them in the order you type them. So um, let me start with a question for both Meredith and Martin. Um, having gone through the, the cycle of developing your initial TAMP and your um, two and four year targets, how has that influenced the way your agency does business, especially in your investment decision making? As you look forward, what has it um, changed, I guess, um, in the way you were doing it before you undertook the federal requirements to what you see going forward? Meredith, do you want to start? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to say that the, the specifics of infrastructure condition, NHS target projections, 
maybe has not yet changed any particular way we do business because uh, to Martin's point, you know, our, our capital program is already developed. Well, technically our six year program is out um, in tour around the state right now for finalization by January. But it is, and similar to what I said, it's gonna be used as a template for other asset management building. Uh, performance management, we're going to integrate all of our TPM targets, safety, infrastructure, condition, system performance, into uh, dashboards and information tools where both for leadership and for partners, we're going to be measuring these things. We're going to be monitoring these things. We're going to be informing decisions based on these, um, these measures and these results. And we need the tools in order to collect and curate and share all of that information. So it's a sea change to, to identify the right measures and to stack them and layer them to develop an informed um, picture. But that's probably where we are right now is integrating these measures, this plan into uh, the next stage and replicating what we've learned to the the other elements as we build our standard practices across the board. Thanks, Meredith. Martin? Yeah, I think um, I would put out the, with the Wyoming saw about two, uh, two to three things that, that, that changed when we started actually sitting there saying, okay, we are going to do action to change, um, uh, to change our our, um, our percent and everything in order to come up with a target. The, the first thing that I that I think that I'd say is that you know Wyoming was one of those states that had a lot of uh, structurally deficient bridges um, by the federal de uh, definition when we started. And quite frankly, you know it was an interesting thing as a performance manage a person studying performance management. What that was is that our bridge department. Uh, considered the decks as a lower priority. They, they basically said it was like a roof on your house. And yeah, you have to go out there and put new shingles on the house once in a while, but it is not as critical as the substructure and the, um, and the superstructure. And so, first of all, you know, the, the turning it around and saying, well, this is how we're going to measure the effectiveness of your, or the, uh, your state of good repair for bridges. That changed that we all of a sudden had to start doing a lot of bridge decks that we weren't doing before. Um, so that was one change. Another change that actually happened with it is that it made us sharpen our pencils and say, well, how much are we actually spending on bridges? Because for me to stand up and say, well, I want to increase uh, bridges by 5% or 10% um, you know, or, or even higher, we eventually went with 30, that getting back on, well, how do you actually define how much a bridge costs? Because our bridge department was actually measuring it from abutment to abutment. And so actually we had to go through quite a bit of, of work to actually determine what a bridge actually costs um, just by the way that we we're measuring it. And that actually fed into how we set the targets. And so that was something else that changed on that. And then the last thing is that since we are now very aware of, the, um, of how we measure the state of good repair for the bridges, that it has reduced drastically a lot of these things that I call um, the hang-ons onto projects because when you before when you would go in and say okay we got to do a bridge deck repair on this, uh, then people would go well we got to do the approach slab and we got to do the bridge rails and we got to do you know the approaches and on and on and on and they um, and what's happening now is that the very real um, realization that no this is what, how we define a state of good repair on the bridges and quite frankly a lot of those other things are just going to have to wait and so. It changed the focus instead of these bridges just continuing to, um, to develop the projects bigger and bigger. The, they really got uh, they really got down to well, what is going to what is going to improve your performance out there on the road. So those are really kind of the three things. Thanks, Martin. Um, here's a question for you: In the deterioration curves that you presented. Um, the curve that you presented is the 15.5 million annual investment in bridges inflation adjusted. 
And if you could answer also, if it is, you know, how you set um, your inflation figures. Okay, so um, the, first of all, the one is, and, and this, I'll answer the first one, the second uh, question first, because I think it ties back in there. One of the things that we actually, surprisingly enough, when you, you know, we had, how we set inflation actually is a very poor man's way of doing it. We have our programming engineer, our construction engineer, our contracts and estimate person, and um, they get together, review the literature, the what the feds have and so forth, and, and they come up with a recommendation for a shorter term of inflation and then a longer term inflation. And, uh, you know, so quite frankly, part of what why bridge, when you look at the bridge curve on that, is you know when we decided through that little committee, you know, kind of on the on the low. I know some of the states actually hire economic uh, experts and so forth to help do that. You know, Wyoming's doing it on the cheap, but um, to get a standard inflation rate for all of our management systems was something I did not realize that we did not make clear to them um, until we were putting the final uh, the the final steps into the target setting, we realized that Bridge was estimating a 3% inflation rate and Pavement was in, uh, estimating 4 So it was one of those uh, things that I just assumed would happen, but it did not. That We had to actually back up with the management systems and tell everybody that, okay, our policy is 4% per year, um, you know, out for 20 years. And so that, that's obviously a part of the reason why the Bridge curve is going up. The other part is as like everybody, our uh, our bridges on the interstate are 60 some years old now. You know they're coming up on 75 years, and we need to, you know, the, so we're getting more of them. So we need to overinvest now to keep that number down, um, that 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 sheer number of, of uh, structurally deficient bridges. All right. Um, so for both of you, what are your state definition for state of good repair. Meredith, do you want to start? Can Martin start? Because i got to look it up. <laughs> I know it for bridge. I don't know it for pavement uh, off the top of my head. Uh, okay, Martin? And I'm going to talk about it in generality because, uh, um, you know, a state of good repair versus just strictly what we are shifting um, to the measures that the, the, that the federal government are uh, the federal government is asking for. So when I talk about state of good repair, I generally talk about you know the the like on the bridges what what percent is in good, what percent is in poor. Um, when I first started putting my slides together, I was thinking I might delve into you know are your fares getting worse year after year is an important thing to look at. But Wyoming is moving back to defining a state of good repair as you know, quite frankly, not, you know, we want to track both the things of good and, and poor, uh, like what the, the federal government is asking for. But we're moving towards that um, just because we think that we don't want to be, we don't want to be caught by our legislators saying, wait a minute, you got to present a good that uh, you're reporting to us and the feds are saying this. And so, yeah, we're moving, we're moving to the federal one. It'll take us a year or two, but that's our goal. There it is. Yeah, it, the, that was part of the reason why I wanted to defer was um, we struggled with the not necessarily largely understood structurally deficient definition, but at least the commonly used under, um, language of structurally deficient. And of course, we were still challenge with the governor's um, challenge to address our structurally deficient. So when we were trying to move to the, the conversation, the lingo of good, fair, poor, there's something to be said for the simplicity of good, fair, poor, but there's also that lost in translation between what um, in Bridges case, what we define to be a state of good repair I was rough, um, rifling through my notes, I believe to be a six or higher versus what is the structure, what is the federal definition of the good, fair, poor. We're still 
having those conversations or ex rather explaining those to our partners. Um, the, the clean, good, fair, poor definitely resonates, but we have to build up that um, lingo and, and change it from the structurally deficient. And there's also state requirements that we report on structural deficient inventory versus federal measures that we report on good, fair, poor. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to use both at this point in time. Thanks, Meredith. Um, this is a question from Martin. Can you please expand on your pavement management system? You mentioned system, the system is similar to hers. Do you own this system or do you, or is it a off the shelf product? Um, that I, if I mentioned hers, I meant, I was mistaken that it was a, um, and yeah, yeah, normally we do, we don't try to, uh, to talk too much about the, the vendors and so forth. Wyoming is a, is an agile assets, um, user. And so we use the agile assets pavement management system and, and with the models, you know, for example, the model that I showed on the, on the interstate. Those are what it produces by uh, by us having years of, of data that goes into it. So we're we're pretty confident about the pavement, but we are using um, the uh, the what used to be Pontus, now BMIS uh, or BIMS, um, and for bridge, and we're using Agile Assets for the pavement. Thanks, Martin. Um, this is a question for both of you. Will um, you be, are you using the new metrics to forecast condition or are you using trends to predict condition? If using the new metrics, is this something you were already doing or an internal process change that came with a new rule? I'm guessing focused more on the pavement side. Who wants to take this first? I'll, I'll go ahead and take that first, you know, and, and that's, and, and not to beat the drum up too much about that one chart that I showed or that you can download and see that the, you know, that that's the reason why that green line is above our target is so we, that, it, you know, all the projections we were making was by a composite of cracking right and rut, and then we put some weights to it and combined it out and we came up with a a magical number and that's what we've been feeding our legislature for years agile assets would then put out projections for us based on differing funding scenarios and so what you saw on there was um the the uh, was based on that composite rating of of um of, of pavement crack and, and ride i mean excuse me ride cracking and rutting of course faulting on concrete roads and um and we are we're, we are trying to execute the change order with agile assets to switch it over to the to the fed to the, to the federal tenth mile with just uh, the, the new cracking and then also the um, the you know the tenth mile with the three and just saying whether it's it's in each each one of those bands. Meredith, I will say that we we have a very mature. Uh, process informed by historical trends and the ability to um, do projections. And I think the biggest change is to incorporate the risk and resiliency vulnerability information into the management systems, both respectively. Um, that's going to be it's an active conversation. It's doable, but it does take a little bit of um, of change in, in the analysis. And I think that's going to be the biggest next um, change for our analyses is to really begin to understand the vulnerability of our assets, especially when we're faced with roughly, I want to say, 3,000 miles of of um, coastline, um, so we're excited for that next evolution of our analysis. So this next question is for you, Meredith. MDOT collects all NHS data. How do you address the funding problem on non-MDOT NHS in order to meet targets? 
how do you set targets for non MDAT assets? Yeah. Uh, we do it iteratively. Um, so our Office of Materials Technology does the condition assessment. They drive the entire NHS regardless of ownership. So then it, it, that data is supplemented with any plans and programs for those um, assets that's identified through our capital programming process with MPO partnerships and our TIP and our STIP. So that, that various different condition data, historical information and planned future investments are layered on top of each other and inform each other. Um, the, then the biggest way that we set targets or that we inform state targets by local is through MPO um, facilitated conversations. They're the ones who at the regional level are having those conversations with the local owners. And we do have some who own very, very little mileage of the NHS. So what's their add value add to the conversation? It's really just, we want you to be a part of the conversation versus somebody, a jurisdiction like Baltimore City, who's the third largest owner. So it's it's iterative. It's informed largely in the short term by the, um, the capital programming, uh, the six-year capital program that already exists. The long-term projections, we're going to go out after the initial TAMP, before the final TAMP, and have more well-informed conversations and just continue to inform the analyses on the back end based on our collaboration with all of our partners. Um, there's no set formula. It's just iterative and uh, we trudge along, sort of. <laughs> Thanks, Meredith. Uh, the final question is for Wyoming, although I think, Meredith, if um, this is a topic you're dealing with, I think um, it would be good to hear from you. So are you planning to address cross-asset allocation analysis as part of the asset management investment strategies? And if the answer is yes, if you could elaborate. Okay, I'll, um, I'll sure be uh, glad to talk about how this is a, a difficult topic and how we're trying to uh, how we're trying to address it so um what we what we try to do from our standpoint you know we as i say is that we how how our history about this was is that we started with the pavement um we said we don't like the direction that the pavement is going and so we kind of well we absolutely looked at it almost in a vacuum and said well how much more money do we need for pavement and we gave them that money what, you know, obviously what happens when you do that is that you didn't do a trade-off. You know, we didn't, we didn't analyze, well, where does this money come from and, and what are we losing? What are we cutting from, uh, back from, from the um, traveling public by making that decision? And then when we did the same thing with Bridge, we started trying to bring in some other information and so forth. Um, so this is how, you know, like I said, I would put us down as, as, as aware and a novice is is kind of where I would put us in the in the, uh, the maturity model is that we know we know it's kind of weak here at Wida, but basically what we do is that we track what what are we spending our money on? Why are we building these projects? We are, and we're trying to keep those out separate so that we know well this is about how much that we're doing in the name of safety. This is how much we're doing in name of of a uh, multimodal, this is how much we're doing in the name of safety. I mean, uh, with um, with capacity or or mobility, and and so I was able to show um, before we set the targets that okay, we are accepting that we're going to increase pavement, we're going to increase the funding of bridge, and this is historically where these where the monies are coming from. We're reducing. Um, we're not really. Re Wyoming is not really reducing mobility, but we're actually cutting back on, on our safety projects. And is that the right thing? So right now, what I would say under my title of um, maturity model as, as being aware, I am making my executive staff aware of, of what funds 
are being removed in order to fund these pavements. You know, the these decision makers that have got to do this, they're taking money away from other places. They're not doing it formally, but by their applying these projects coming up, that's actually they're voting on well what's being reduced, and that reduction um, we're being uh, we're identifying it from a programming standpoint and feeding that back to the executives and saying, well, is this really where you wanted the money to come from? I know that's kind of a bad answer, but it's a, it, from an ASCO standpoint, it's probably one of the topics that we talk about more than anything else. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Martin. I think it's an accurate answer, so it's good. Uh, Meredith, do you want to, are you doing anything with cross assets? A, yeah, I can do a quick um, bullets. So we, our leadership absolutely wants that stacked, layered, um, comprehensive picture. So stack data, we're working with a variety of different partners to look at tools and processes and just best practices available. Um, we have not found the silver bullet answer, either platform or information, uh, but every conversation we have gets us closer in terms of those trade-offs, which I did allude to earlier, um, you know, it's it's absolutely imperative that we have informed system preservation trade-off conversations. And right now, a lot of the information is available, but divorced from each other piece of information. And so there are technologies and platforms and conversations available to us to stack them uh, and we're we're getting there, and probably within the next year we will find some uh, level of of stacked information to inform all of our various different asset management conversations, which are progressing. Thanks, Meredith. So we're slightly over time. Um, so thank you to everyone, those that, and also to the audience. That was a great set of questions. The next ne webinar will be held in two short months on December 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we will shortly have topics and presenters confirmed the, um, at the, the ASHTO annual meeting at the um, Subcommittee on Asset Management um, gathering. We brainstorm topics and um, we'll be using that as one of the inputs to formulate the, the next for sessions. So if you have ideas, please send them to Matt, Steve, or myself. And um, and as a final reminder, you can go to tam-portal.com and get all of the information you need for past and future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.